Hey everyone, welcome back to FPL Fran. Today's video is going to be my game week 11 transfer plans, and we'll be discussing FPL finally after a good game week. And probably, if I'm being honest, I have got my passion back to the game. Sometimes this is how FPL is. I think when you have a run of reds in a row, you have good teams on paper, and things just aren't going your way. It's really hard to to try and 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 I guess rationalize a lot of the outcomes. And on a game week like this. I can just appreciate that I was super, super lucky across the board and can be very happy about a lot of the outcomes, my team, everything except for one person and one player, which would be Dominic Calvert-Lewin, but we'll talk about him in a moment. In terms of my Game Week 10 review, though, we've had a really nice rank rise. My, my Game Week rank is very, very high. I could have been higher, I guess, in theory, if I played Rogers over DCL. A lot of people will probably immediately, you know, instinctively point out to that, and I think that's fine because... In terms of the outcomes, Rogers came off at 68 minutes. I, I think he wasn't actually injured when I was watching the game. He had a knock, looked in pain, and was subbed off immediately for Duran. And I think that's also a po point in the game where actually Aston Villa completely lost control of the game. So, you know, if you're a Rogers fan, I think that's actually a, a positive sign because it's not like Aston Villa played any better with him off the field. And so that's a good positive sign. I have to say, I did expect Dominic Carver Lewin to start. Seeing that he was facing off versus Southampton, I just thought it would be a, still a good opportunity, regardless of how poor he is as a football player, for him to, to return a little bit better than Rodgers did. Now, as it turns out, Rodgers scored off of a set piece. He, he practically got a tap in. I mean, it, it, it was the easiest goal ever to finish from, from Morgan Rodgers' point of view. So, yes, of course, it's easy to sort of look at the outcomes and say that was an obvious decision, but I still think that sometimes when you measure up against the opponents, that's something that you, you kind of evaluate, that maybe Calvert-Lewin is a play ahead of him. And I think I do this all the time, and sometimes it goes well, sometimes it doesn't go well. A good example of this is I played Leif Davis versus Leicester at home, and he scored a screamer, effectively. So, so some of these things, you take these punts, I feel like, from a manager like myself, that I like to play fixtures, and I had still the sense that Dominic Calvert-Lewin would start. Now, because he's played so poor, I, I do really think that this is the week where... I'm finding it hard to justify whether he's even going to start. Uh, and that makes a huge decision for DCL because he just has to leave my team. Not necessarily leave my team this week, and I'll talk about that in transfer plans, but he's not going to be a part of my starting 11. That's absolutely something I'm certain of as of this game week. Um, but yeah, in terms of the game week 10 review, it's not yet over, and Bumo and Flecken are still to play. I had a look at some of the statistics in terms of how many players people have remaining. It seems like the, the average player around my sort of rank percentile still has 1.2 players left so you know indication of course that some people own Raul maybe just Mbumo and, and of course some people like me have two or three players left and I think that's fine um, I'm not expecting to make a lot of gains here I'm really really happy with the rank rise from around 1.9 million to 700k if that's where I end up that's fine Flecken has disappointed me so much it wouldn't surprise me that he does nothing but Mbumo is still an asset that I'm very happy somehow can still give me a, a few sort of differential gains and, and that's that uh as of this week i think i wanted to talk about a couple of things in my back line so leaf davis is actually really good because he's one of those classic examples where in fpl you get a return but i really feel like this is also a player that i could very well sell next week so spurs and then man united not good fixtures and 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 generally we have to look at the statistics so far this season if switch are the worst defense by far so we've been looking at teams like Southampton. I think we've probably looked at them and Leicester's teams to target. But on defense, Wolves is up there as well. But Ipswich is by far the worst defense in the league that we have on display. Maybe that's because they also are quite an offensive team. And I think to give credit to some of these sort of relegation sort of contenders, they all seem capable of scoring versus even the, tough of the toughest of opposition. So I won't say, for example, like any time someone faces Southampton or Ipswich or even Wolves, for example, that they're not going to give you value for a potential clean sheet loss. But you'd still take the chance more often than not because they're still inferior offenses compared to the rest of the league. And that's just simply how I tend to play my defenses. Uh, Davis was amazing. Leaf, that is. But once again, looking at the fixtures, Nottingham Forest, Crystal Palace, Bournemouth, a lot of these fixtures, people will say, why wouldn't you keep Leaf Davis for these fixtures? But I would have to say that still, the expected goals conceded, if you actually look at this column here, it's still shocking, right? Even when they're playing a team like Leicester, of course, the red card has an impact, but for the most part, they are conceding around 2.3 expected goals per game. It's very hard to justify that Leif Davis has value unless I can miraculously continue to, I guess, guess when he will return a goal or an assist. 
And as we saw even last week, he got an assist and still only got two points. So it is tough. And I do think that because the fixtures just aren't good, good enough, Leif Davis could be someone who could leave my team in the future. Lewis, however, there's a similar sort of issue where with Walker back, which was a huge surprise. So totally, I, I, can't, I can't believe it, but, but Pep has done it, right? Total lie about Walker's and, and how he'll be back after the international break. And suddenly Walker springs into action and he plays 90 minutes. When they were chasing, crucially, Walker stayed on the pitch. And like many times we've seen this season when Walker was on the pitch as well, Lewis played, he was subbed on, and I think he was a big part of City trying to actually claw back the comeback versus Bournemouth. And, and so that's a positive sign. But my concern really with Lewis is Man City play in the midweek versus Sporting. You're going to deal with that situation. I really think that Lewis could be playing another 95 minutes in a Champions League match. He's done this so many times with Lewis. I can't see him risking Walker once again. And then the question mark, I suppose, is whether Lewis is going to play good minutes on the weekend. Now, with Lewis getting a, a rest here, it's not impossible to say that some of the midfield players could maybe get a rest and he could get you know involved in the action that way. Stones and Diaz being out for now is also a positive in terms of, I think that gives Lewis more of a chance to play as well um, without someone like Akanji or Stones sort of playing inside. And so I think that's a positive for Lewis, but I still think that he's someone who's a little bit on thin ice and a potential transfer out. But you know, I no longer have the issue, I guess, where I'm tripled up on Man City or you know don't have the ab ability to move into a Foden Hall in the future. So I have that flexibility. I don't think that Lewis necessarily needs to be a sell but I feel like I was very fortunate to get that price rise. Maybe I could also get out of the Lewis business if I feel like his minutes are going to project poorly down the line. But as I said, Leif Davis is also a, a potential transfer target out simply because I don't think I'll be playing him in the near future. Um, as far as Guardiol, just an incredible player, just absolutely ridiculous luck as well. I mean, if you look at some of the goals he scored over the last five weeks, he scored three goals and look at the XG of the chances. What can I say? Yosko Guardiol, just a monster. But I've bent one of those holes, and it's hard to, I guess, evaluate when you look at the city fixtures saying that he's going to be an easy, easy keep. I mean, these are a lot of fixtures where I don't think I'll be playing him potentially. So Liverpool is a good example. But because he's so good, I, I do think there's a question of, of even asking about whether he's maybe essential in my team and definitely not an immediate transfer out. So that's a positive. Guardi uh, Gabriel was someone that I also benched this week uh, quite comfortably. Newcastle scored. The, the chances in that game was around one, I think, for both Newcastle and, and Arsenal in terms of the expected goals. Um, so I, I feel a little bit fortunate to have benched Gabriel because I think the skill issue here is maybe not reading into the fact that Pep totally lied and, and Walker just somehow magically appeared out of thin air. But hey, that happens. And, and Gabriel is very good for me, I think, as soon as the Nottingham Forest fixture comes in. We can obviously give a lot of credit to Nottingham Forest as a team, and I'll probably talk about them in a moment, especially around my transfer plans. But Nottingham Forest have been a very, very good team this season. But I would still, you know, picture them as a team that is definitely more tilted towards defense and less tilted towards offense. They clearly did score four or I think three versus West Ham with the red card of Edson Alvarez. But the main thing I would still say is that Nottingham Forest, in my opinion, is still probably a bottom half offense. Some people might take offense to that, as I said. I don't think that that separates from the fact that Chris Wood is probably an absolutely insane pick and he clearly isn't in my team. But that's just the point in terms of the overall team offense as opposed to, you know, how I feel about Chris Wood, the player, that sort of thing. Clearly, Chris Wood is fantastic. So that's sort of my point on Nottingham Forest. And I do think quite comfortably I'll be playing Gabriel for a lot of games from Nottingham Forest forward. So that's, that's the point. As far as the rest of the team here, I mean, Palmer was still brilliant. Bruno actually scored. And, and, and for anyone who's held on to Bruno, once again, I think he's still an amazing FPL pick. Um, and I'm really happy that he scored because that's what you get when you have intangibles like penalties. And we know that a lot of people have completely scuffed Bruno assists in the last few weeks. So he's been pretty unfortunate, I think, to not get a return. So a penalty, I guess, feels due. Palmer, though, is, is the player that I did go out on a minus four from. I moved away from Trent and I moved away from Bruno. And right now, Bruno's fixtures are rearing its head. When I look at my team, I have absolutely no way to get to Bruno. And I don't think I have any plans to get towards Bruno. But for anyone actually in the midfield who's actually looking for someone, I think he's clearly one of the top picks that I would recommend for this game going forwards. Uh, but Palmer and, and Davis, ironically, I think, have still outscored the hit, uh, which is a positive so far. And it just shows that Palmer getting a bonus point in a game where he didn't get goals and assists just once again shows how impactful he is from a sort of bonus perspective. And 
of course, whenever he gets a return, how close he is to getting those additional bonus points, which clearly make an impact this season. And Bumo still to play. Nothing to say about him because he's clearly a very easy hold. And Salah was the big player that I made moves for, right? Two transfers this week where I went from Salah, or rather from Holland and Dibbling to Salah and Cunha felt good because Dibbling actually got benched and Cunha did well. Or Kunha, sorry, actually, I apologize. I probably should be not mispronouncing his name. But yeah, Kunha score, actually got an assist and probably could have got maybe another assist. I think if Sarabia was a little bit more decisive as a player within the game. One of the things I'd say about Wolves is they are a very good offense, but they're also an absolutely awful defense, which is also, once again, to the point of Leif Davis, Ryan Knight Nuri, I think, is very similar as a player where, of course, the, these players are in such offensive positions. Yes, they can absolutely get a hole here and there, but it's very hard to call it out, and their defense truly is dire. The, the amount of chances that Crystal Palace had actually gotten versus Wolves just, to me, made me a little bit cold on the idea of g g doubling up with Ryan Eitnery and Leif Davis. So that's sort of my opinion on, on those sorts of players. But I still think they're good. It just means that I don't think I, I need to rack my team full with these players. And I still think that there's some value at the end of the day with players who can also get you points through clean sheets with good fixtures. And that's that. Um, as far as offense, clearly Carver Lewin is awful. Solanke, probably the, the biggest story of this FPL game week is that whole narrative of how we react to sample size. I, I personally think that I was a little bit cold and slanky because anytime you have a player who doesn't get involved in action for the last three weeks, that's fine. But there were also plenty of games at the start of the season, particularly the four games that he had already played preceding the, the three before today, where Slanky had chances, where he had assists, where he had expected goal involvement. And I think that the, the best thing is always to try and marry up the two, right? If you have sample size, use the full amount of it as opposed to sort of being, I guess, a little bit too restrictive. And just looking at Dominic Solanke for the last three weeks and sort of evaluating that that's going to be him, the player uh, for the future. So I feel like he was very, very lucky, of course, to get two goals, one assist. That's 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 a haul that's probably worth three to four game weeks worth of, you know, Dominic Solanke playing. But he's got Ipswich at home next, so I'm so excited about that. And Sun as well, despite the Sun early benching, which clearly was a part of sort of injury management. And my hope for Sun is that he gets rested for Europe and he gets to dominate Ipswich at home on the weekend and potentially be a captaincy shout. But I still think it's going to be tough to do that um, if Andrew's going to manage his minutes again. And so that makes Solanke and Salah potentially the, in, the more interesting options for me and my team. Kunha, great. Rogers great again. But hard to sort of justify playing him next week versus Liverpool. But it might just have to do it depending on the moves that I have to make. My concern this week, as I said, is going back to Lewis's minutes. Will he actually play after the Champions League match? And will he actually play versus Brighton? Because if he doesn't play versus Brighton, I don't think he starts versus Brighton. My mind is set towards more of a defensive transfer than anything else. As far as Carvert-Lewin, you know, it, it just goes from bad to worse. Yes, Carvert-Lewin, as I said, is a, is a poor finisher, but this is probably the worst that we've seen from him. And it's also gone to a point where his manager has reacted. And, and we can clearly see it's the end of the road for him, I feel. Unless, I guess, the tides are turned. He becomes a bench player. He starts scoring off the bench. And we might see Dominic Carvert-Lewin back in the fray later down the line. But for now, I think it's probably the end of the road for Carvalho and my team, but I'll talk about him in my transfer plans. Roger's fantastic. So yeah, fine. Seven points lost against Carvalho. And I don't think I was really thinking about it if I was completely honest. So maybe that's an issue on my point. But as I said, having watched the actual Rogers chance and watching the entire Spurs versus Aston Villa game, Aston Villa had lots of chances. And I think Rogers even was able to squeeze in potentially a Watkins goal if Watkins could have taken on a one-on-one. -on -one. But yeah, he's a very, very good player. And we'll need to manage and, and watch his minutes after the Champions League as well. Because it's clear that Rodgers, as I said last week, where with this sort of really, really tough schedule with a couple Aston Villa players back from injury, I don't think we can necessarily guarantee that he's a 90-minute player. But clearly he's proving that he doesn't need to be a 90-minute player to do well. So that's Rodgers for you. And that's the team. So very, very happy finally to have a good game week. So we're back here with the transfer plans for game week 11. But this is all done on the Fantasy Football Hub My Team Pick tool. So have a look at the link in bio below to have a look at this and access it yourself. You can subscribe still with, I think, 30% off up until the end of December. Fantastic tool, Fantasy Football Hub in general, uh, to help you climb rank and also gain back your sort of spots in mini leagues if you've lost them so far. Having a look at my team here in Game Week 11, as we can see, Game Week 11 is, is really about, unfortunately, some tough matchups for teams that I think we've been invested into for a while. So when I talk about this, I mean Arsenal facing off against Chelsea. So a bit of a mirror matchup there with Palmer versus Gabriel. At the same time, we've got Guardiola with a pretty tough game on paper. Brighton actually looked like a really competent team. So I think that 
not great for the city defense that I've invested into. But then some teams like, for example, Man United, Spurs have really, really good games here. And that shows you the, the golf in quality. And Bumo with Brentford, a fantastic game. So not exactly, I guess, the most easiest game week to navigate for my defense. It clearly looks pretty poor on paper. And I think the the sort of AI probably recognizes that as well. Flecken with a good game, but what does that even mean nowadays? I don't know. Calvert Lewin with once again, projected, I think, to start per the AI, but I'm not really 100% certain that that's going to be the case. So, you know, my assumption here is that I might just have to play Rodgers over Calvert-Lewin, which is the reality here. And then Davis and Dunk aren't going to produce much value for me because Dunk still seems like he might be managing his injury. It's a horrible game anyways. And Davis, you know, class player, 100%. But I'm not going to be playing him versus Tottenham away, particularly when I'm so keen on playing two of my attackers in this situation. What I would like to say is that the move that I think unites my team or that I, I really feel like I will stick by is the idea of going from Sun to Saka in game week 12. So that for me feels like a, a pre-booked move no matter what. But if we go back to game week 11, this is the team. If I think Lu Lewis will not play, my plan is to go out of Davis and to go into Dallow. So Aitnuri is recommended. I do think Aitnuri has a better fixture, but I do like the idea of going into Diogo Dallow. Why? The reason is simply because I, I think United actually do look okay, at least on defense. Rude is clearly probably an inferior manager compared to what Amarim will, will do in a few weeks time. But the next three fixtures for Dallow are really good from a sort of clean sheets perspective. And I think hopefully the, the bet that I'm willing to make is that under Amarim, he will still play in a wing back role and potentially be a little bit of excess value that we might not have anticipated. Um, a few weeks ago under Ten Hag. So that's sort of my little punt here with Dallow. And this is because I think that if Lewis is benched, I don't have a good starting back three. Why not actually utilize Rodgers once again, bench DCL, and actually I'm pretty happy with this team for game week 11. So that's sort of one of my thoughts. This would be to go for Dallow, as I said, and this is if I think Lewis will not be able to play. So this move is Leaf Davis to Doa Dallow, I was previously considering Pedro Porro when I've talked about it, but I do think that leaving enough money in the bank so that I can go from Sun to Saka is crucial to me uh, from an FPL planning perspective. And 0 0.4 million in the bank does give me enough cushion to do that. So that is really something that I have in my mind. So let's just say if we, if we save this as my plan almost and go to game week 12, the key move, as I said, is to remove Sun at this juncture for Saka, who just has a brilliant run of games. Now, a lot of people will look at this and also sort of mention that, okay, Saka is actually going up against Nottingham Forest. If anything, Nottingham Forest actually looked like a better defense than Man City. Why even make this move? First of all, I think that there's a home and away aspect to it. So I do really like bringing Saka here. Sun has clearly always historically been very good versus Spurs. So I'm sure a lot of people will make that point too. Um, but, I, but I really find it hard to back against the idea that I really want to start with Saka with a great clean state of games. And I do think that he's still someone that I would like to have over Sun. And because Solanke now sits in my team, and maybe with a bit of hindsight, I feel less worried about him as a football player in my FPL team. I'll be able to play him anyways, and I can even field in Dallow, for example, in a game week like this if I want to bench Solanke as well. So that's something that I really want to do. And I think that game week 13, that's the week where I'll be selling Dominic Calvert lewin This guy is awful. And once again, it'll be sort of, I guess, two, two good fixtures missed for Dominic Carver-Lewin, but, but what, what does that even mean, really? Dallow is quite nice because, once again, if I optimize my team here, what the Dallow transfer actually gives me is the ability to have a really good defense in game week 13. What I think, what I'm missing, clearly, as a Guardiola owner and a Lewis owner, is the ability to rotate against the poor fixtures. Dallow gives me that exactly versus Everton at home. So I really like the value of keeping Dunk as well for this fixture and also Dallow here, allowing me to bench both my Man City defenders. Now, some people will say, why are you doing this? Guardiola is a must play. But as you guys know, I like to play my fixtures. I, I bench Gabriel in some games. I bench Guardiola in some games, sometimes for better, for worse. I think most of the times I'll, I'll go with things like clean sheet odds and just the, the, the quality of the fixture, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the week where I plan on bidding Dominic Carvalho. And I think at this juncture, I can reconsider someone like Raul, but this is also a great time on Gaming 13 to simply consider a forward from Brighton. And I do think that Welbeck or Jao Pedro are my options. 
Welbeck is probably the player that I prefer right now because I can't guarantee Jao Pedro's fitness. Welbeck has been playing really well this season. I think his minutes have been really good. If Jao Pedro continues to be out, he'll stay on penalties. He's also picked up direct free kicks this season. So I really do like him. But as, as it might turn out, Jao Pedro could be starting games as soon as game week 13. And if I really feel like I, I, can, I can go for Jao Pedro and I feel like his minutes are safe, then I'll be going for Jao Pedro instead. So that's as far as I'm thinking about right now from a fantasy perspective, because I do think that when I look at Salah in my team, I am going to be keeping him for potentially the long haul. So when we look at Salah's fixtures, ultimately, Aston Villa and Southampton, great games. Man City is a mirror matchup with Holland, so I'm not worried about that switcheroo. The key thing is that even though he's got tougher games like Newcastle, like maybe even Everton away technically, or Spurs away, Palmer is the player that I feel like can cover me in, in a lot of these games, where he's actually got really good fixtures like on game week 14, on 13, and even on 17, for example. So that is what I'm thinking about. Plus, Saka can also do a lot of the coverage there too. So I feel like with the three of these players, I am willing to go against the Holland captaincy for the foreseeable future up until at least game week 18 plus. I still think that Salah will be my captain on game week 18 because I do believe that that fixture is Leicester at home. So really, we're talking about me coexisting without Holland for a long, long time. And Ultimately, I'm actually really comfortable with that. So those are my plans up until game week 13. Now, this is specifically, as I said, if Rico Lewis is out, or at least I predict him to not be able to start in game week 11. But what if I do predict Rico Lewis to start? In my opinion, then I think I might have to front load either the Welbeck transfer or I can actually go for Chris Wood. The only reason why I don't like the Chris Wood transfer, even though he clearly looks like, you know, God's gift to humanity is a lot of Wood ownership has risen right? And sometimes we try to play the game where we look at the idea of risk and Wood is very, very good. Clearly that's the case. I mean, look at, look at how the AI has sort of suggested his points. I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. But Wood is clearly one of the transfers I'm thinking about. The way that Wood would work is that he rotates really well with Morgan Rogers. So here, for example, I can bench Morgan Rogers for Liverpool away, not exactly a good fixture. I make this fixture, I optimize the team and it looks exactly like this. On the next week in game week 12, this is going to be the week sort of team on paper, right? Because Wood has Arsenal away. All my Spurs players, unfortunately, have the, the City game. And I still have the ability to go from Sun to Saka here. So that was sort of my plan. And I think I can still do that. And obviously just play Morgan Rogers as well, right? So that's something I can do. I could even bench maybe either Wood or Solanke. I, I'm actually tempted to probably bench Solanke at this point because I actually own double City defense. And even though I won't be playing or actually I probably will be playing Lewis anyways I don't really want to go you know against I guess the city defense just for that sort of miracle potential so that's sort of what I'm thinking about here potentially in game week 13 and then on game week 13 I don't actually have that move right here in terms of the Brighton player but actually maybe I don't have a move planned which I which is sometimes a good thing right you don't want to be pre-booking too many transfers in advance in a few weeks time I'll have Ipswich I'll, I'll, I'll have Wood versus Ipswich at home instead and I think that that makes my team a little bit stronger for the future potentially so that's another move that I've been thinking about. And then I would play Guardiola reluctantly versus Liverpool away or potentially, you know, around this time on game week 13, who knows? Maybe we actually believe that Reese James is real. Um, I, I can make moves towards him potentially. I don't have too much money in the bank. So that's one of the issues, but it could be the case that I actually move Lewis out eventually as well and then bench Guardiola. So that could be an option given that Reese James is actually at 4.9 in the defensive position. If he's alive, if he's, if he's all good, I could be actually owning him for a decent run of games here for Chelsea, which I think is quite good. The AI clearly predicts that his minutes are going to be poor for the meantime, which I think is fine, right? Understanding or trying to predict Reese James's minutes is very tough when he's actually someone who's not completed too many games of football in a row in the past. But he's actually, you know, played quite a fair few minutes in the last few game weeks. He gets the rest, I guess, within the European fixtures, and he's been playing really good minutes in the Premier League. So I do think maybe just maybe Reese James could be back. And, and so he could be an option clearly for game week 13, uh, but it's hard to be 100% sure about it. But as I said, Lewis to James could definitely be on the cards um, in a few weeks time if I have enough money in the bank to go there. Because clearly with the 0 0.1 here, I don't have that accessibility per, per, se, per se, but that's something we'll have to just monitor. I think I, I still should be able to do this move because we'll, if, if I think about my team right now, I think I own Rico Lewis potentially at 4.8. I might be wrong about that though, so I could quickly just check on my sort of transfer list here in FPL in the app. Actually, no, I do own him at 4.7. So, so the hub client's definitely correct in terms of I won't be able to go to James. And, and that's a tough thing as well. So when I sort of look at my team here, 
It might be the case that I go out of Guardiola instead in a few weeks' time, but I'm not really keen on doing that. So we'll have to see what happens going down the line. Potentially, I might just have to suck it up and, and, and go Guardiola. And then on this sort of team formation here on Game Week 14, I've got two free transfers. I can start to roll up, etc. And maybe I don't need to force that sort of Lewis move. So that's something that could happen as well. But those are my thoughts in terms of my transfer plans for now. As I said, those are my sort of key moves. I think either going to Wood, which I feel like is a little bit, you know, against the ownership. Another alternative option, actually, if I don't go for Wood, is just simply going for Welbeck, right? So if I go for Welbeck, actually, like all the way back here, and I reset sort of my pick client, I could indeed just go Carver Lewin to, to Welbeck. And the way this would work is that Welbeck has re a really poor fixture here. I probably still play him maybe over Rogers despite Rogers having the Liverpool fixture. And then in, in game week 12, I do, you know, Santa Saka once again, and then I can make that transfer. And then on game week 13, I actually have Welbeck here in this fixture versus Southampton at home, which I think is also a very, very good game. But with Wood being so good, and I feel like his minutes being a little bit more safe than Welbeck still, I suppose the question is just how good is Wood really? And, and, and I probably need to be doing a little bit of thinking this week because Someone like Welbeck's ownership is much lower than Wood. So the opportunity that I can climb if Wood, you know, does, like, I guess, performs the same as Welbeck or performs a little bit worse over this run of games is there. And I guess that there is still a reality where when we look at someone like Wood's fixtures and I look at it now, I mean, Chris Wood is someone who will, will have tough games. Arsenal, Man City, Man United away. But still, because he's so good, later down the line, I don't think the Aston Villa and Brentford games actually look that bad at all. So that's something I've been thinking about. You know, how good is Wood really? Clearly, he's close to, I think maybe he is actually the top striker in the league, maybe joint with Haaland for now. But I suppose the, the question really is how good is Wood over a much better run of games and how, how good can he sort of maintain this sort of level of form? Because the reality is Wood has scored at an absolutely absurd rate. And I don't think we can necessarily say that that's the norm for him. But even his baseline could be much better than the likes of, of any sort of replacement that actually has a good run of games ahead. Because when I look at someone like Welbeck, I do think he's got better games. He has Southampton, got Leicester, West Ham, these sorts of fixtures, which were fantastic, for example, for Wood. And I can imagine they can only be good for Welbeck too. But even still, Welbeck is not someone who has got good, good fixtures on Game Week 11 or 12 himself, whereas Wood actually has a really good one on Game Week 11. So I do think I'm leaning closer to the Wood move, but it really does, really does come down to those Lewis minutes in the Champions League. So I will be monitoring that. Uh, but those are my transfer plans for now. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you guys have a wonderful game week or have had a wonderful game week and, and we'll continue to have that with the sort of Fulham versus Brentford game tomorrow. And yeah, I'm, I'm excited to say that I, I feel a lot better about FPL. Sometimes you think you're making good decisions and you want, I guess, some, some of the outcomes to sort of bear that out. And it feels good to have it in this game week and hopefully we can continue moving in that sort of positive direction. So take care. Goodbye. And I'll see you guys soon.